check ride in your future? Well, we're gonna be asking questions of a DPE in the hangar. Hi, welcome to In The Hangar. I'm Dan Milliken. And I'm Christy Wong. Today's episode is brought to you by our awesome sponsors, Colton Mortgage and Flying Eyes Optics. Well, we get a lot of questions about check rides. All the time. And to have a DPE that you can just casually ask questions to is like gold. Invaluable. Invaluable. And joining us again is one of our favorite DPEs, a DPE that I use for a check ride. Near and dear. Is Joey Johnson. Joey, thanks for coming back hey, on the not show. No problem, anytime. Christian, good to see you again. Good to see you. Okay, so what we're going to do is we are actually going to open this up to our studio audience sure. and get a lot of questions. Um, hopefully, <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, I may have to goad them a little bit. No, they're good. Um, but I'm going to start with with just a few. Um, I'll tell you a story that I heard the other day from somebody. He was on a check ride. His his initial his private. And, and he was flying in a light sport with the DPE. And they were going through, they hadn't quite finished, but they'd gone pretty far. And they were in, doing a, a steep turn demonstration and the propeller snapped. It was a carbon fiber propeller, snapped and broke off the other one and effectively you know, trashed the plane. And the pilot, the student pilot, put it down gracefully in a field with no problem at all. And uh, that's passing my book. <laughs> exactly. So the DPE passed him. He said, you got it. And um, later when he went for his commercial or one of the other IFR commercial, one of the later ratings, the DPE failed him and also told him that the initial DPE should never have passed him because he didn't technically complete it and all this kind of stuff. This is correct. So he, uh, but you would have passed him. No. Well, I just say that, that the fact that he put it down successfully. I've had emergencies during our check rides. Oh, you have. Yes. Okay. Ooh, I'm going to talk I'll, about I that. I want to hear that story real quick. <laughs> so, but anyway, if you have an emergency during the check ride, this is one of the things that we brief. Right. Um, that the check ride is over, and we are now focused on handling the emergency and get ourselves safely back on the ground. So. If he didn't finish the ride and actually gave him the certificate, then that was in, that was incorrect. And what I meant when I made the comment, that's a pass on my book, is, hey, he did a great job. That's a pass. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I thought interesting, too, is that the DPE let the student fly it to the ground. So the DPE is not officially the pilot in command of the right. aircraft during the test. Right. This is the first pilot in command mission of that pilot. Correct. Well, with a passenger. With a passenger. Because the DPE oh, well, that's like solo. Yeah, solo, yeah, right. but yes. Yeah. Um, okay, well, anyway, that's just an interesting uh, That is tidbit. an interesting story. Yeah. Okay, so I want to know what kind of emergencies now that you've experienced as a DPE on check rides. Scariest one. The scariest one? Oh, gosh. I haven't had Let's really, just go straight to the top, I, I guess. I haven't had really any scary really? Uh, emergencies, nothing. Look at Joe. He's made of what, steel. What, have you only had, like, four check rides in your life? Right. <laughs> um, you flew with me. True, <laughs> that's, true. I have flown with you. I can attest that. Um, well, I had an electrical issue once in which the master switch uh, failed on the aircraft, and it basically shut down all the electrical power on the aircraft. Uh, the landing gear on this aircraft was electrohydraulic, so therefore we had no power to put the gear down. We were into now uh, an emergency gear extension, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, we followed the POH. We, uh, you know, completed the procedure, if you will, which in that airplane is, it's a piper, and if you know pipers, you, it, you know, it's a, it's a knob. You push or pull the knob yeah. and the gear free falls, right? right? So, but you have no way of knowing, there's no external indication, you have no lights because there's no power to tailor the gear down, and now you have no radios, you can't squawk 7700, oh, well, you can't, you can't call them. the tower, hey, does my gear appear to be down? So when this uh, occurred, um, we just picked up our cell phones, called the tower. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I would. That's yeah. yeah. I've said, had an uh, electrical emergency. Did, did and the, uh, the 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 pilot um, did he remain PIC in that, or yeah. do you ever? No, I didn't take. Oh, there was no need for me to fly. He was able to fly. I actually worked the manual for him uh, mm -hmm. and ran the checklist to make sure that we weren't missing any steps. Everything was followed verbatim. And um, in, in that moment, do you say the check ride's over? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that way, everybody over. can just. Uh, it's, yeah. You can relax, I guess would be a term, right? right? Yeah. You can relax, we're about <laughs> to die. During your emergency, <laughs> yeah. yeah. During your emergency. 
Uh, and then we reported it to the tower and, and uh, came in, landed uneventfully, of course, and uh, taxied aircraft. And at that point, it's a matter of doing reports. So. Okay, before we kick it to the uh, studio audience for, for DPE questions, what is the number one question you get these days from a student? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good question. Um, <clears throat> in, in what frame uh, of private, mind? Private. So in the private... Um, I know what it is. <laughs> How much do you cost? <laughs> yeah. I very, do see that a lot. That is definitely a popular question. What's it going to cost me today? <clears throat> well, um, and, and let's, let's go off that. Let's just... There, you see in, in social media aviation forums, people just saying, oh, it's a ripoff and they want cash only and blah, 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 blah. I mean, what would... But I know, I've done some research. You guys don't... You're not getting rich off of check rides. No. And you have to no. pay a lot of your own, uh, all of your own expenses. You're not an employee of the FAA. No. And so the FAA requires you attend all these different things that you have to pay your own way That's to. That's true. So the seminars and the training that we have to attend, it's not overly expensive, but, you know, it can add up. Uh, you do have to have a computer, uh, preferably a laptop with internet access. At one time, I used to carry a printer with me. Did oh, I well. say printer twice? I'm sorry. A laptop. No, you didn't. You didn't. Okay. Um, so you need, you need a computer, let's put it that way, uh, portable, so a laptop, that you can access the FAA's websites in order to process the necessary paperwork. Um, at the end of the test, you can either uh, email them their certificates or you can print them. I make it a habit of printing them so they have something physical and tangible that they walk right. away with that they feel that they've earned. So, right? Okay. Well, and becoming a DPE, that is oftentimes out of your own pocket as well, correct? Yes. Uh, so some of the training expenses are out of your own pocket. Okay. Uh, so um, initial uh, DPE training, which is done in Oklahoma City, when they were still doing in-person training, is a week-long course. And so you pay your own hotel, your own meals. And I think the course is around 375 to 500 I forget. Depends on which one you're doing, how much training you're having to do. Right. <clears throat> and then... Um, biannually, so to speak, you know, every other two or every other year, you have to do your recurrent training and there's an expense associated with that uh, for that recurrent training. And then there's also an in-class attendance requirement. Now with COVID, we've been doing that. We've managed to do that virtually, but they're talking about going to back to in-person training. So when you're going to have hotel expenses, travel expenses, et cetera, when they, when they start doing that again. Okay. All right. So let's uh, kick it to our audience. And if you've got a DPE question, step on up to that microphone. And Hi, I'm Heather. Sure that Hi, Heather. I am about mm, one solo cross country and three night hours away from my check ride. That's what I have left. And I do know that people probably ask you this question a lot, so I'm going to take something out of it. Logbook entries, your paperwork, and all of your licenses, I know are a common mistake. Sometimes that you check that and it's a no-go from the beginning because maybe they didn't have a stop on their cross country or the 150 nautical miles. So I've heard that that is pretty common. But beyond that, what is a very common mistake that causes a student pilot a discontinuance? A discontinuance? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I've always heard don't call started, it you then failed. it's not gonna be uh, a discontinuance. So the test has to begin. Once it has begun, it will end one of three ways, and that's going to be with an approval, a disapproval, or a discontinue. During the paperwork and logbook review, the test has not started. Therefore, if we come across something that doesn't meet the necessary requirements to complete the test, then we don't start the test. Right. Uh, this, I'm assuming this is what you're referring to. Well, I'm just saying I know that, that that's a common thing. You can't even get started. But let's say you're to the practical part. What is, uh, are there certain maneuvers that are common, failures for students? Is there a commonality that you see a lot? I mean, do you have your own hot buttons? I know some DPs have what they call hot buttons. They really like students to no, do certain things. No, uh, honestly, I try to evaluate each maneuver according to the ACS. Uh, that's my standard answer. Uh, <laughs> But um, we all have our own uh, pet peeves, personal preferences, and stuff like that. Um, but I try to evaluate all of them equally and give them all the necessary, you know, evaluation that they need on that particular maneuver. Um, as far as failed maneuvers that I see more often than others, the steep turns is one at the private pilot level that they, they oftentimes do. Um, not that often, but occasionally a stall uh, in which they get themselves into a spin and can't recover the aircraft and I have to take the aircraft uh, to stop the spin. Um, so that's not a good situation. It usually doesn't end well. Um, and then uh, occasionally landings, 
Uh, the takeoffs usually not so much, but the landings, uh, they get themselves extremely slow, they drop it in or stall the aircraft on final, that type of stuff, or failure to correct for crosswind, that's another common one on a windy day. Um, the, the, I would say, you know, without a doubt, having that question, <clears throat> if I were to summarize the answer, I would say aeronautical decision making is probably the one biggest cause. Okay. Uh, at the private level, we still haven't fully developed that skill, uh, even though we like to think we have. Um, a, a gentleman much smarter than I am told me once, he said, remember this if you remember nothing. He said, uh, if you knew now, today, half, just half of what you thought you knew when you were a private, you'd be a really smart guy. <laughs> and uh, so I thought those were some really good words of wisdom. Um, but yeah, the aeronautical decision making is certainly one that, that can lead us astray. Uh, students will oftentimes uh, um, overcompensate for their skill ability. I've had applicants take me out in 30 knot winds and then can't get the airplane back on the ground. And I go, well, who's gonna save you when you're out here by yourself? So this is, the, you know, the standards don't change. If you choose to fly in those conditions, those are the conditions that you're gonna have to, to meet the standard in. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, all right, good. Um, next question. Hey, uh, first I want to say uh, thanks for coming out and being on the show. Sure. Uh, I have my own interesting check ride failures. I've one of the one of the probably many students that failed their for half of their first check ride. I did great on the oral, and but the weather conditions were just not ideal, and I had get their itis, so my boat got sunk. But how many times have you encountered a situation where the uh, CFIs have not given their students the appropriate endorsements? That is a very common one, actually. We uh, did a, a show a few years back on just the, that very factor was uh, lack of endorsements, then the check ride's over before it ever started. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, we have an episode, and I'll put a link up there, that um, because I, I talked to Joe about coming on to the show, and I said, hey, what would be a good topic? And he's, and that was what he said. The number one thing right now I'm dealing with is CFI is not doing their endorsements properly. So we did an episode all about that. Sounds like CFIs need to take a class. <laughs> <laughs> well, I bet you've thought that once or twice. Yes, I have. <laughs> yeah, and I can, I mean, I can speak to that as a CFI, because there, there has been one time where I, I inherited a student from an, a previous CFI, the student had not pass their check ride, and I failed to give this student the 6149, which is basically the retest. I, I, I did the 6139, I made, you know, even redid, and then just, I spaced it. I mean, CFIs are humans too. And it was, and the thing is too, the, um, the 6165 is not, very user friendly necessarily, and so you're kind of going through, and you're like, "All right, I've got um, all the endorsements." Clarify, you're talking about the circular, not the rig. Yes, yes, oh, yeah. Sorry, see, yeah, okay. the, the AC, 6135, AC, the circular, sorry. not the rig. Uh, <laughs> I can't see why there would be a mistake here. Well, now, yeah, it's the AC 6165. It's it, it's not necessarily user friendly, and so. No. Um, you have to really know how to use it, and uh, even going through it and knowing how to use it, you're like, okay, I think I've got everything. I've endorsed seven endorsements, and then sometimes you just forget one. Yes. So, uh, back to your question about the endorsements. If an applicant shows up and they're missing an endorsement, if the instructor is available, oftentimes we can round up the instructor, get the missing endorsement, and move forward. So it's not always an end of the day kind of deal. It just really depends on if he's available or she's available, as the case may be, uh, in order to make the necessary endorsement and move on. Okay. Uh, the next question could put you potentially in the hot seat. So if you don't answer, it's totally cool. Uh, are you familiar with Ken Whittakin, the San Antonio uh, yeah, DPE yeah, and San that. Antonio FISDO? Uh, what are your thoughts on that whole situation, with them being released and, or from his well, duties? Well, this is what I can say about that. I'm not privy to all of the, the facts surrounding that situation. Um, if on the surface you look at this, the, uh, what supposedly took place, then one might formulate an opinion that he was wronged. Um, however, there's probably mitigating factors that we're not aware of that the FAA said, no, he was wrong, not us. So I can't really say one way or the other because I was not directly involved in the investigation. I don't have all of the facts surrounding that. So I don't speak to an opinion, if you will, on that. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, you should run for office. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> you smoked, but you did not inhale. <laughs> right? All right. All right, thanks. Yes, sir. Okay, so, uh, yeah, that was really good, um, uh, especially on the endorsements and uh, 
Um, we actually are going to have uh, Ken on. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Good deal. So, all right. Get down here, Rockin'. Reach it. Okay, I'm Mary Latimer. Okay, as a flight instructor and a mentor for a lot of other people, I get a lot of uh, people prepping for an oral. And a lot of instructors tell them when the, instru when the examiner asks a question, you answer like you would in a court of law with a minimum number, a minimum number of words. Just say it as briefly. Don't, don't, don't elaborate in any way, shape, or form. And my opinion is, tell them what you know. Don't go down rabbit holes. What's your... I, I actually like that advice that you give them because what you don't want to do is you don't want to, sound, you don't want to seem standoffish uh, where uh, it's yes, no. I've actually had that uh, applicant once before. And at first it was funny because I could see what he was doing. Um, but as the process went on and I kept reminding him, look, we're, we're here to have a good time. We're here to, to make sure you know what you need to know, that you're a good, safe pilot. Um, so just give me the, you know, give me the full answer. Don't make me drag everything out of you, which is what it turned into towards the end. So yes, I very much appreciate what you're telling them out there. Don't go down the rabbit holes, but by the same token, don't short me to where I'm having to pull teeth, if you will. Exactly. I, I have told a number of applicants that at the end of the day, I scratch my head and I'm like, I should have been a dentist. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All the teeth right. you had to pull. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, you know, the corollary to that um, would be, um, I lost my train of thought, um, but, um, you know, say trying to jump time. track. I apologize. <laughs> okay, take your time. Uh, but uh, if uh, they're looking, basically the examiner's not looking for a 100% on the oral. Okay, so if they miss a question, it doesn't mean it's the end of the day. Okay, now I would tell them, it's kind of like, if they don't know what a whole short line is, that's a 50-point question, you're done. But if you make a, a small error in something else, it may be like a three or a five-point question, and typically the examiner's looking for a 70%. Is that kind of where you're looking at it? Well, um, in my briefings, pre-briefings to the applicants, what I tell them is, is that although the ACS will imply that you have to pass everything 100%, uh, we do have some discretion to the extent that if we ask you a question and it is obviously uh, there may be some impairment to the knowledge or something to that effect, we can do follow-on questioning to ensure that the student does or does not know that particular task area, okay? If it becomes apparent after the follow-on question or questions that the student does not know that, then that would be a failed task or subject matter. So. Um, I've heard the stories of the one question, you failed, go home kind of deal. Um, <clears throat> I can't say that, that, that I have or haven't done that because, it, again, it, a lot of times it depends on the subject matter, you know. Sure. Uh, so there are some things out there that will absolutely uh, cause problems, potentially kill you uh, if you don't know what you're doing. And so this, it's a one-on type deal, like uh, either you know this or you don't, or you can do this or you can't. Um, right. Otherwise, they don't have to panic if they miss the, miss the third question that you ask them, or at least they have to think about so it. So what, what I generally advise the applicants is just relax. If, if, if you're having some trouble uh, stumbling you know, for an answer or something like that, but you know where to find the answer, oftentimes I'll say, show me. You know, show me, show me where this information can be found. Uh, this is not to allow them to look up an answer in the sense that um, we're saying, okay, you, you know, it's an open book test, if you will. Right. But the, these tools are at their disposal when they're flying every day. So if you have a FAR aim in front of you and I'm asking you specifics about a FAR or something like that and you can't quite quote the regulation but you know what the regulation is and what it's about and you can show me this is what I would do, um, I would find that that would probably be acceptable. Okay, and that's kind of what I would tell them. It's like if you're on the ground and you would look it up, the examiner will most likely allow you to look it up. Not everything, but at least a few items. Right. So kind of hopefully lower that panic level for a few of the people. True. Well, we're not lowering the standard. No, but, but what the we're panic trying to level. do is set them at ease. Yeah. Yeah. No. Lower the panic level, not lower the not standard. Not lower the standard. That's <laughs> correct. Yeah. That should be your new motto. Right. Lowering the panic level, not the standards. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Very good. Um, all right. Uh, Julian, you have a question? Or are you just... Um... Hello. I'm Julian. Um, so right now I'm towards the end of my... Uh, well, towards the end of my private pilot license path. And so just coming around the time of cross country, and of course, check ride prep. Um, but what I've always noticed is, and what I've always heard, is that DPEs have certain personalities, uh, just like a regular human being. So say as far so. as... <laughs> say it ain't so. Say yeah. it ain't so. <laughs> so as far as, um, what are pros and cons to different styles and personalities of a DPE, per se? 
Okay, I guess I missed the question. Try one more time. Um, so where, where are the pros and cons to uh, like having uh, certain personalities of a D BPE? Like one may be uh, one that's really relaxed and one may be really stern. So like what's the pros and cons of a DPE that's like that? Um, wow, that's a that's a tough one. So, so what, okay, I guess I guess in a way, if I can rephrase the question, would be, would you, if you had to go on a check ride and as a as a student pilot, would you rather have like a stern but fair DPE? Would you rather have a relaxed but maybe doesn't cover all the standard? I mean, may, is that kind of what you're yes. saying? Right. That's what I'm getting. What kind of DPE would you pick? Well, first of all, I want to make sure that I picked a DPE that was doing his job. Okay, and by that meaning, if you if it, it, it's possible, I'm not saying it happens, but it is possible, you know, that things get overlooked, and then now you find yourself in a situation where your certificate's being revoked because the DP didn't do the necessary work, and now you're having to retest. Um, this has happened. I was just about to say, I know two examples. I actually know multiple people in the recent years, they went to the relaxed DPEs, the easy DPEs. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go. And they've lost certificates now because what happened was, and, and probably one of the more famous examples was that DPE in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. That's that correct. I actually have a, a friend that ha their flight instructor certificates are revoked now. That person went to that DPE, got their flight, all, their flight instructor certificates, um, and then when that DPE was pulled, you know his uh, privileges and everything were pulled. Uh, a bunch of people lost their certificates and, and ratings. For the record, in that particular instance she's referring to, there is no limitation as to how far back they can go. They went 11 years. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. 11 years. Yeah. So, so, you, so, so be wise. Choose wisely, as uh, Indiana Jones' third movie. So personally, said. this is just my my opinion on the matter. I would rather go to a firm but fair DPE oh. like Joe. You know, I I think Joe is firm but fair. I'd rather go to him because I know he's doing it right. I I know I'm not going to look five, ten, eleven years down the road. You know, and oh, here in the news that Joe had his DPE revoked, and now my certificates are at stake, or, or whatever the case may be, because of those instances. All right, thank you, guys. All right, okay. Um, well, that's a re really good case. Do you have a question? Yeah, come on up. So, um, what I try to do is talk a little bit in between to give you guys time to walk yes. up. <laughs> Young lady, state your name. My name is Kaylee. I'm Kaylee. His daughter. Okay. <laughs> uh oh, this question could be a this could be a loaded for, question. Yeah, here it could be a loaded. Sure. So, Kaylee, what is it like being a parent and a DPE? Ah, balancing. Oh, that's a very good question. Okay, so, uh, well, first of all, uh, balancing parenting versus testing, evaluating, you oftentimes find yourself at home evaluating your, your children. <laughs> and sometimes they don't pass. That's right, they don't pass. Um, and and so. We've got a discontinuance here in yeah. the kitchen. Your bedroom is a discontinuance. Yeah. And unsat, unfortunately. Yeah, unsat, yeah. So, um, but that is a tough line to follow because oftentimes the DP work does come home with you. And so what I find myself with Kaylee oftentimes is um, I've had a, 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 a bad day. Uh, and what I mean by a bad day is I want everyone to pass, mm -hmm. but that doesn't always happen. And so when I say a bad day, I've got one or, or two applicants that didn't uh, make the grade. And so I feel bad for them. And so my mood's a little uh, off. And, and then so often you come home and then they don't know this. Right. And so they take the brunt of, of that bad mood, if you will. So um, but to answer the question, what's it like to be a, both a parent and a DP? It can be tough. It can be tough. <laughs> wow. So, um, are you, so DPs are humans too. <laughs> Did not know that. I, I know. was beginning to think otherwise. Yeah. So. Amazing. And just to put your mind at ease, it, it's like that for most of the professions. Even being yeah. an airline pilot and a parent. I mean, you know, you have a bad landing and you come home and it. And you, you know, kick the you, dog and. I would never do that. Oh my gosh, Dan. Yeah, because you'd be afraid to bite you. Well, this is true. But either way, I, you know, it, it is like that. I mean, I've got a nine-year-old son, and, and there have been times, too, where, like, I, I had a rough flight, or we had crazy passengers, as the times are, or whatever, and I come home, and, you know, I, Mitchell just wants to be all over me, you know, mom, 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 and I'm like, Mitch, 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 you know, like, you, 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 it's a, it's a balance. It's a balancing act. So, but that's a very good question. Good question. It is a very good question. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> All right. So, um, 
We've got more questions. This right. is good. So go ahead, Ed. So, uh, Edward, uh, my question is with regards to, um, uh, I'll tell a little bit of a story here. Uh, during my instrument training, uh, my first maneuver uh, took off and uh, didn't really brief the DPE on what we were going to do. Uh, he told me the flights that we were going to, the airports and such we were going to do and the approaches, but I didn't brief him. I briefed the plate and, and went through the plates and that sort of thing. Uh, and the first approach ended in a discontinuance because, well, I didn't tell him what we were going to do, so he started asking me questions, and I got confused on the uh, VOR and uh, failed that. One question for you, what would you recommend to CFIs for somebody who doesn't, you know, for their pilots that aren't very verbal and don't talk through a lot of their things, but they do the things competently? Um, so if I understand the question correctly, what you're trying to say is you're not a very outward person, if you will, yes. right? Um, and so that, you think, it may have played a role in your uh, completion of your instrument rating because you didn't adequately brief or relay what you were attempting to do to the examiner, is that correct? Yes, and then I got confused because he was asking me questions. And okay. I so, um, <clears throat> well, my suggestion to you, um, Let's work on that, of course, right? <laughs> um, try to be a little more talkative. But um, oftentimes we find ourselves talking to ourselves inside, right, uh, about what we do. Okay, don't forget to do this and, and, and dial in this frequency. And, oh, by the way, i got to remember to identify the frequency or I've got to set the inbound course or we've got to change altitude at this distance, et cetera. So that would be something that you could relay to the examiner if you think that he's confused or doesn't understand. The chances are, and I don't know your particular situation and, and to why it ended the way it did or what led up to that. Um, however, um, oftentimes what I find, if I see a student going astray or an applicant going astray, I began to ask questions to try to determine or to ascertain why are we doing this? Where are we going with this? What, what is the, what, what's the uh, ideal outcome you know, in this situation right here? Um, and then if they can answer that, meaning, well, I was doing this because, et cetera, um, <clears throat> and it relays to me that they know what they're doing or that they, they were planning to do what they needed to do, then I'm okay with that and we, you know, we move on because now I, ha I know that they know what they're doing mm -hmm. rather than them sitting over there and me wondering, what is this person actually doing here? So uh, more on that, would you give any advice to CFIs to get their students to be more vocal? To tell the CFIs? You mean? Before, before they come to you. Okay. If, so if I understand that correctly, you want me to say this is what you should do as an instructor to make sure this doesn't happen to your students? Yes. So that would probably come down to the preparation segment of the training uh, in which the instructor should sit over there and play evaluator to see how you're going to respond. Um, and it's hard to do, it, it really is. Um, it's, a, it's, it's certainly a, an acquired skill, because even as evaluators, there's not one out there that won't tell you there's oftentimes tendencies to want to try to, to uh, parlay information to the applicant, but you're not allowed to do that. So. Um, well, and, and Edward, I'll tell you this. Um, before my private pilot check ride, I had, I can't remember if it was an instructor or somebody else. They told me that you need to be vocal. And for some reason, I thought, you know what? I just need to speak my thoughts out loud. Which is exactly what I was just saying. Right. Yeah. And when I did that, and, and um, I, I, when I met the examiner at the beginning, I said, I'm going to just speak my thoughts out loud. And I told him that so that he would kind of know that I'm just not being chatty Cathy for the sake of, but that I'm, I'm just going to talk out loud. And what's interesting is that in my pilot flying ever since, I do that whether I'm alone, whether the cameras are on there or whatever, I, I talk out loud things and I find that I'll do them, I'll take the, I'll actually focus on them better because if I do a checklist by just reading, I'll realize I didn't do the last five that I just read through. Whereas if I say it out loud, then it's, it's a lot better. So I think that um, for me, it was a matter of I just had to speak my thoughts like what Joe was saying. 
And my advice from one CFI to another CFI is if you're like an independent CFI, for example, just uh, doing part 61, I would say um, have your student go up with another CFI, just kind of like a mock check ride to get another set of eyes on it because they'll be able to relay that information back to your primary CFI saying, hey, they need to talk more, they need, they need to do this. Because your CFI, they may have, they've flown with you so much, they may be able to interpret what you're doing. They, they may not necessarily realize, oh man, he's not talking the way he should, so. Yeah, and it just, for me, telling the, the DPE that I'm gonna tell my thoughts out loud kind of gave me permission to do it. And so I, I wasn't stressing about it as much, I, th I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, did, were you able to retake? Uh, so for that flight, uh, uh, I made a turn before I was supposed to at the hold, and uh, he said, okay, check ride's over. He asked me, he's like, were you supposed to turn there? And I was like, no. He's like, okay, check ride's over. I was like, can I continue? He allowed me to continue the rest of the flight, and then uh, all I had to do was that one hold again. Okay, that's not so bad. Yeah, so yeah. I had a happy ending. Yeah. Yeah, it was a learning experience. Absolutely. Okay, thank um, you. I have a question. Go for it. Why are DPEs in such short supply these days? So, um, it will be a good, good question, <laughs> right? uh, Because we're all here on this show, that's why. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, well, the biggest problem right now uh, is COVID has made a lot of them sick. And okay. so we have a lot of them that are out uh, and haven't recovered. Some of them uh, have other medical issues, so we have that uh, as well. Um, I would say, this is purely speculation on my behalf, that roughly half of the examiners we have are doing 100% of the work. The other half um, it, are either out with medical issues or uh, simply can't cover that much mm -hmm. of the work. Um, for a variety of different reasons. So, I, you know, not trying to throw anyone under the bus. I'm just saying that some people have reasons why they can't do as much work as other uh, designees. So, I mean, there's times when I'm like, man, I really need a break, you know. Um, when you look at the rolling count of how many check rides you've done in the last 90 days, it shows up in your DMS, and you're just like, wow, how, where do I find the time to do these? And then that kind of comes back to the, the question my daughter brought up, how do you be a DP and a parent at the same <laughs> right, time? Right, exactly. You know? Got one more question. I'm sorry, Michael. I didn't. That's okay. All right. Um, as Christy mentioned a, a second ago, uh, when you fly with a student, you are you're actually their first passenger. But for a for a young for a young green student, you're not just a passenger. You're you're like the FAA God with a <laughs> with a small G. All right. Uh, but you're also their judge. Have you uh, for somebody with test anxiety? Have you ever? flown with a student, not necessarily during the check ride, but like a pre-check ride flight, just to, to kind of oh. ease, ease a student's anxiety? I mean, or, or at least met with them beforehand, before actual testing day? So there's rules and regulations regarding what you're referring to or speaking of. Um, we're not allowed to do training in the last three hours of their preparation. So that would be, that would fall within that guise. Um, if I were to go out and fly with you and give you any sort of training whatsoever, you would have to get three more from an independent instructor, other, i.e. other than me, uh, after that flight before you could test with me. Um, well, outside of a training aspect, just to, just to be a passenger in the seat with them so that the day you do fly with them and judge them, that's not the first time they're seeing uh, Now, I have not personally engaged in that. I'm, I'm sure it's happened but uh, not me personally have done that. Never well, wouldn't that. that still fall in, within the regs? Because even though you're saying you're a passenger, you've got a student pilot who can't take passengers, so the passenger right. has to be an instructor or an examiner. Right, That's correct. Exactly. So you can't have just somebody along for the ride because so it, it would violate a, a reg. They're automatically yeah, in that capacity. Right, correct. you automatically cannot do that. I mean, I've talked to DPEs like on the phone leading up to a check ride just to get clarification on the layout, where we were gonna meet, things like that. And then once I spoke to them, I somewhat humanized them, which made my you know, stress level go down a little bit regarding the check ride. And, and, and I think, it, I've heard it said from other DPEs that um, student stress is one of their biggest enemies. And, and as, as Joe mentioned, he, he had a bad day because a student failed. 
He wants every student to pass. And I think that as the student pilots start to understand that, it might help their anxiety and, and, and relax a little bit and focus more on, on, as you said, having fun and flying. So, um, you know, that, you know, being relaxed can really help you perform better in a check ride. It's a hard thing, it's an unnatural thing, but these guys want you to succeed. Oftentimes I will interject um, lighthearted humor throughout the course of the evaluation. You? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, th to try to keep you at ease. Um, so as I mean, we- He's got Snoopy everywhere on his everywhere. coffee mug to his yeah. icon to his emote, everything is Snoopy. So, uh, I mean, just an example, um, I might reverse the hair color and the eye color and say, you have blue hair and green eyes. Is that how this works? Or uh, with respect to the conviction, I go, now it's been at least a year since your last conviction, right? You know? um, and so what this does is kind of let them know I'm as human as you are, and I'm not here to just take your money and run. I'm here to give you a fair evaluation and determine that you meet the necessary standards to operate safely within the national airspace system. Great, thank you. Awesome. All right, well, Joe, thank you so much yes, for coming sir. on again. Absolutely. Uh, as always, uh, it's a great to have you on the show. Always, always, always a pleasure. I wanna know what questions you guys uh, in our um, viewing audience have for DPEs. We, we love these kinds of questions because it keeps it fresh mm -hmm. and there's, uh, things are always changing and fluid. So please leave those comments below. All right, and uh, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, we appreciate you helping us grow the channel. And until next time, we'll see you in the hangar. hangar.